speak with you today about our product. It uh, may seem a bit self-serving that we come to the table as an AMS product, as an AMS company, but I want to assure you today I'm bringing to uh, the forefront here much of our experience and what we've learned with ACGI. Uh, just a little bit about me. I, um, I came from a background of technology for over 25 years. It's Gosh, it's been a lifetime just in technology, implementing enterprise software, bringing new products to market as a product manager for two uh, Fortune 50 software companies. Um, most of my time was really in the background of product management, trying to make the products better, make them easier to implement uh, for customers. So uh, today I, I run the sales organization for ACGI software, but I always am a, a participant in our product management process here. So today we're going to talk about uh, what it takes to really choose the right AMS. And I, I can't just come forward with you today and say that, you know, there's a right way to do it. We really have to start to make a look at some considerations of your organization. Uh, really, the, your culture of your organization is a big part of it, but also just the ability to, to look at the requirements, to pull the requirements together, to, to go through an implementation process. It's all very important in selecting not just the product, but also the vendor that is going to service you. So today we're going to look at um, why do you want to even consider a new AMS, but um, also, more importantly, what are the things you should not do in the process of selecting an AMS or things to be very cautious of. We'll look at the selection process itself, what are some recommendations we would have from a perspective we work with many, many consulting companies like the Bross Group that bring to us requirements and a process that seems to be fairly standardized across the board. There might be nuances to how consulting companies guide their clients on selecting a system, but more or less there's some, there's some basic, basic process and there's a basic milestone that you have to go through to get through the process successfully. And then we'll talk a little bit about what to look for in an AMS uh, product. And then as an added bonus is the implementation. If we have some time and the time allows today, I would like to talk to you. Just because you go live, you selected the vendor, you selected the right product, you're all, everyone's happy that they've got it behind them. Well, the real work begins. And whether or not you succeed or not succeed, really begins with that implementation. So a very important point, and I hope that we will talk about that today. Again, quickly about ACGI software, and then we'll put this behind us, but we've been in business for 20 years, absolutely not a fly-by-night company. What ACGI became known for very early on, back in the 90s, was uh, bringing to market a 100% web-based association management system. So back then it was a lot tougher to talk about it. We probably wouldn't be able to have a, a, a good conversation about what, what types of software and technology you should choose. Uh, but fortunately we were on the right path and uh, I've got a lot of maturity in the marketplace. We're based here out of Columbia, Maryland, right between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. Our first largest market is the Washington, D.C. area. Second largest market is Chicago and then everywhere else around the globe uh, makes up our, our customer portfolio. Product lines that, we, that we've developed and support are Association Anywhere, an association management system, and also Certelligence for the, our credentialing organizations that we work with, those who have certification programs or accreditation programs, and that's all they might do. Our customers are professional societies, trade associations, certifying bodies, and also association man management companies who have multiple clients. We have 64 employees at ACGI, uh, project teams around the United States and Europe, and we have over 370 installed and maintained databases um, in our hosting centers. So why new AMS? Let's look at some of the catalysts or driving forces behind implementing a new AMS. 
it summed up pretty well in this quote that was taken out of not too long ago out of the New York Times entitled Big Data Scientists. They call it janitor work is a big hurdle. Well, it says, according to the quote, users can easily spend between 50 and 80 percent of the time on manual processes, clerical work, data entry, pulling data, that might be reporting, cleansing the data, keeping it clean, manipulating the data, formatting the data. Those of you who are using database systems today can probably, at, at least at some point, you've probably looked at your system and, and you can see how much work is really involved. And sometimes good systems are going to help you really start to do things more efficiently. Why would you look at a new AMS? Well, there's many benefits to that. And I won't go through everything today because I'm assuming some of the basics are there. But centralizing data is a very, very important thing. You have to have one system of record. Whether you have support multiple efforts across your organization in membership, meetings, educations, publications, accounting, marketing, so on and so forth, all those organizations have to work together so that at the end of the day, the right hand and left hand know what they're doing so that your customers that you serve, members, non-members, possibly partners, affiliates, chapters, regions, committees, board members, they all are getting access to data that is in real time and the data that has integrity. So why do most organizations switch to a new AMS system? Well, there's, there's probably some of the common more points that we, ha we hear often. And before I go into these points, Justin, I don't know if we had a chance to set up those polling questions. If not, it's okay, we can continue without them. But if I could yeah, ask I'm you to put I'm going to go ahead and try. I'm going to go ahead and try and send that out right now and activate it. Okay. So everyone should see the polling questions on the right. And great. So I have two questions for you, and really, this is, these are the only polling questions we'll have today. But I would like you to take just a minute and try to answer these. The first one is: Have you gone through an AMS selection and implementation before? Yes or no? The second question is, why would you want to switch your AMS? Is it difficult to use? Is it poor members' experiences that you're seeing? Inadequate functionality and reporting? little to no integration with third parties. I'll just give you uh, 20 seconds to check some of those boxes or one of those boxes. Okay, so what we'll do is um, come back and answer these poll questions. I don't know if we have the results in just yet, Justin, but I'll let you flash it on the screen when you're ready. Okay, yeah, um, I can uh, go ahead and close the poll now. Okay. So there's 20 seconds that it'll take, um, but it looks like 50% uh, of the people say it's inadequate functionality and or reporting that is the main reason why they're switching. Um, and then little or no integration, 13%, um, and the first two uh, choices as well, difficult to use poor member experience as 13%. So it seems like an inadequate functionality and or reporting is the biggest reason. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that's great. That's a pretty good indicator and consistent with what I'm, I'm about to tell you. This is what we're hearing in the marketplace. Uh, why do most organizations switch to a new AMS? Uh, usually, uh, we're going to hear a number of things. Poor vendor support tends to be one of them. Uh, just an organization who's under the gun for so many things, whether they have to get the renewals out or they have to uh, get keep registration going for their meetings. So many um, critical tasks that they need to do, and if the vendor's not there to support them when they have problems, it really starts to um, you know, initiate that, that search for a new vendor. 
reporting. Uh, arguably, this is probably the biggest problem that we see in the marketplace. Uh, it's very easy to get data into a, s a database system, an AMS, a CRM, an ERP, a engagement management system, but very, very difficult to get it out and get it out in a meaningful way. Functionality is not robust enough, so that was the number one reason. I guess that was grouped with reporting, so that, that seems to be accurate there. Little to no integration. These days, it's, it's a best-in-class world. There's so many fantastic software companies that have developed technologies that can integrate with AMSs, and sadly, there's so many platforms that just don't support it well. Difficult to use always seems to be an issue that comes up with staff or even members online. Over-customized systems, uh, we meet so many organizations that have had legacy systems and they've had to just cobble on new programs, new application, new forms, new integrations to the website, new um, processes. Well, after a while you build this Frankenstein of a system where it's very difficult to upgrade and incredibly expensive to support from year to year. And of course, poor members experience you may put that one somewhere at the top. If your members are complaining, well, you know, it's uh, enough said there. You have to be a great ser customer service organization. Um, so, and, and you might, mm -hmm. Arch, you mind if I chime in right there? Please. You might actually, hit, you might actually hit on this shortly. Um, it also bears note to, to make sure that you take a look at your internal organization. Uh, to make sure that the processes are in place and the planning is in place before you make your AMS decision and understanding how your users are going to use it, what they are going to do, what they aren't going to do, not just from surveys, but also from observations um, and seeing how people interact with the system that you might currently have. Uh, so you need to understand how the, the change management of, of the new solution is going to is going to fly over so or, or fly with your organization. So very important on the planning side of it you, for you internally, and that's something that we've helped a lot of organizations with um, here at Frost, um, but, but it, it's very, very important to take that time at the beginning part of any kind of implementation, not just AMS, but any kind of implementation. Uh, otherwise, you're like you just said, you're going to end up with the Frankenstein that you're just patching holes of uh, stuff you feel like you need because there's process gaps or or, or uh, users aren't using it properly or it's not collecting what you want it to collect, et cetera. I couldn't agree more. There's um, absolutely uh, has a methodical way to go through the selection process, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But, you know, the, the truth is that you have to get it right. You have to get it right. You can't go too fast into a process. We work with organizations so often and we get the call at the last minute where they have to implement a system because they waited or their board has mandated that they have to go live with a new system for a, an event that is just around the corner. Well, you start to introduce a lot of risks into the process. So along with just the timing but also the methodologies, as Justin mentioned, the, the ways and the approach that you go about implementing and selecting a vendor um, are very important. So I don't want to just be too negative here, but I, this is the reality. The stakes are high um, from some studies that I've done, and you really don't have to look too far. You can Google all these, and you'll find pretty much the same data I've found. 40% of CRMs fail. Now, we are looking at some of the data that's available in the corporate market, not so much in the um, association and nonprofits, but this is fairly, fairly consistent with what you may see with this in the association marketplace, just not as bad maybe. But 47% of CRMs fail, according to the Forrester Group back in 2009. 63% of CRMs failed uh, initiatives as as studied by the Merkel Group in 2013. And below, or a more recent study by the Panorama Consulting Group, over 50% experienced cost overruns, over 60% experienced schedule overruns, and 60% received under half the expected benefits. Now, those of you who have implemented software systems before on an enterprise level know how such a great uh, task it is to do, and you can see where a lot of things can go wrong. But part of the benefits of, of the AMS 
uh, in that, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, they do outweigh a lot of the problems that you might have. You just have to go through the implementation and the selection process very carefully. So failure is not an option. And what does that mean to you? Well, in short, what we've seen with organizations that have converted to our systems and talking to them and reading through, I'm not kidding, hundreds of RFPs where we get to see the executive summary of the current state of our association, they will mention in it we've experienced financial losses uh, from, from the system that we implemented. Things that could go wrong could lead to business disruptions, not being able to meet the needs, as I mentioned, of some of those initiatives like the membership renewals or specific programs like a credentialing program or event registration. Months or years of misallocated time, basically wasted time of your staff. You have to get this right because there's so much that at stake. Uh, members could be dissatisfied being promised something that they never received because of the schedules that run over and over and over. Poor staff morale after a while, a bad implementation, a bad selection of a vendor um, can really get your employees down. Where we've seen that employees actually will leave an organization because they've just kind of had it with as a reflection of maybe the organization that they were not able to successfully implement a, a system. And possibly job loss or permanent damage to credibility when it's such a high profile project within an organization. So some of the costly mistakes, and I promise you we will get to the sunshine soon, but it, it is always worth it to look at these items because there's so much uh, that, that you have to be prepared for. Costly mistakes can be eliminated, but some of the mistakes that you will see is that there's no executive sponsorship and low visibility of the project. You need to have your leaders involved in this. From a board level, they may be ones that are willing to fund it. They may be the ones who are willing to lay down some of the key strategic initiatives, but you have to get leaders involved all along the way to make sure that the project is on track, the selection process is being done in a, in a best practices way. Failure to fully involve users. So we see so many organizations that typically drive the project more from a technology standpoint, and I know I'll repeat this again, but uh, you have to involve the end users. They're the ones who will use the systems primarily. They will be your frequent or your full-time users of the system. They understand some of the frustrations from click to click to screen to screen to process that they do, processes that they do they have to be involved in developing the requirements, and we'll talk about those in a minute. A poor selection process, again, this encompasses a lot here um, of just making mistakes and not doing a um, good job with the selection process. Making the project a technology-driven endeavor, which, uh, you know, IT people, I'm, I'm very much an IT person, but I know also that there are business goals that have to be met. So. You're going to look at a number of things when you start to look at AMS. You might look at technology platforms. You might look at ways that uh, you might lift up the hood and say, what's underneath this hood? At the end of the day, you have to get, your association workers have to get the job done. And so it's, it's so important that you start to look at all these business functions in addition just to the technology that you will implement. Not considering an existing technology in use, so that speaks to really third-party systems or what could become third-party systems, whether you're using um, an outside email vendor, e-marketing firm, or you might be using a community system or content management system. Well, there's, there's reasons why staff at your organizations are using the system, and it's possible that the AMS was not able to fulfill those needs, but also possible that they represent the best practices in using and doing uh, the jobs that they do. So always have to be conscious of, of those, those uh, people and also those applications that are in use in your organization. Project goals, objectives are vague. So this is something that is going to be part of that selection process and, and building requirements. Dirty data, I might mention that a few times throughout this presentation, but Bad data in is getting bad data out. Um, there are ways to remedy that, and it's just really about the timing. What folks should know is that you should work on cleaning up data very early on. 
and all the way leading up to the selection process, all the way leading into selecting your vendor and converting data. Uh, because it can cause a lot of problems, and trust me, it is one of the biggest risks in implementation, and that's data conversion. Over customizing software, don't always want to make the system that you're using today the system that you are looking to bring in. And we find that time after time, organizations tend to uh, create their requirements and tend to have expectations based on what they're currently using. It makes sense, but there's a reason why you're looking to change to a new AMS. I'm prepared for user adoption. This is very, very important. And this speaks not only to your staff adopting the software, but the folks on the outside who will access it through your website. So it could be chapter administrators, section administrators. It could be your members who are going and, and just having access to self-service features on your website. There takes an education. There takes some sort of PR, which you have to be very conscious of. You can't just let the system go live and then start to send out the communication. It's best to create a nice public relations plan or communications plan and let everyone know about it, their participation with the new system. Implementing more modules than manageable. So it used to be in the old days of enterprise software that you had to pay this big fee up front, you had to go through a massive, massive implementation and implement everything at once. Well, times have changed where Systems today, AMSs and related systems are very modular. So it gives organizations and associations the ability to implement in phases and stages. This is completely up to you, but the benefits that we've seen as a products and services company in implementing are that you, know, you can certainly bite off more than you can chew. It makes sense to implement based on the priorities of your organizations and the initiatives that you have because it is absolutely true that that you just most organizations cannot get their head around so much technology at once, and what that leads to is a lower uh, return on investment. It, it leads to lower adoption rates. It leads to just problems um, in education and training and just the usage of the software. So um, I would stress. I'm going to jump a little bit ahead of. of part of my presentation here, but I would stress that you should always try to ask your vendors, you know, what is possible? Can we implement in phases? Even though we're throwing all these requirements at you now, um, what is possible with your software? Some vendors really just want to get it done, get it over with, and move on. And so, again, look for the flexibility. So let's get to the selection process, and I'll try not to be redundant about this, but it really is a checklist of essentials. Um, there are ways to go about doing this, and Justin's firm would, would absolutely be able to guide you on something this. As one thing that we recommend is that you really start to determine the critical businesses, the business and IT goals for your organization. You may do that through an IT assessment. I know that the Bross Group and other consulting firms offer that as a service. You may have resources internally if you're a larger organization that can do that as well. But um, what we often find is that we get into uh, the selection process and some of the, the resources are called away and not able to develop uh, this, I do this assessment effectively. Uh, if, I, if I could chime in there, not, not, not too much like a commercial for an assessment, but <laughs> um, a lot of times, and when we were at ASA annual, we actually asked this question for the folks that came by our booth, uh, basically when was the last time you had an IT audit or an IT assessment, and the majority of them have not had one in three years, minimum. Um, a lot, as you know, if you just even think about your phone, technology changes an awful lot in a three-year time period. Um, so there could be a lot of cost savings in where you're hosting your environment, your infrastructure, your uh, processes, um, taking a look at your staff to make sure they have the right certifications for what your needs are, um, making sure your users are interfacing correctly and the devices you are using are going to benefit your organization. And what devices and what information and what technologies do you need going forward in the next three to five years 
and how does that talk to your AMS and how does that talk to your organization's systems, marketing automation systems, workflow management systems, uh, project management that you're doing. All of those things are extremely important and need to be looked at probably once every couple years. So I uh, highly recommend before you even, uh, I mean, if you guys might be a little too far in the process depending on where you are, but I highly recommend spending a few weeks uh, getting a, a firm to help you with a technology, a full technology assessment um, in order to get yourself ready for this big change because the AMS system is the lifeblood of your association. And you need to make sure that all your other technologies are also working in coordination with that, that, that heart of your organization. So, um, so having said that, I know that kind of sounded commercial-esque, but, but it's very, very important for uh, organizations, uh, I can't stress enough, to get an assessment and have their technology looked at. It's, it's really true, um, you know, that they say reduce the risk on the front end uh, so that you're able to, by doing, taking these steps so that uh, the process goes much more smoother. So um, we absolutely recommend that. Um, conduct research and request preliminary demos. So you're just going to start to feel this out, feel out the market for systems. If you haven't been looking or you haven't been attending industry conferences or going and watching webinars or for demos, you should do that. One of the best places to go are sometimes these industry conferences like held by ASAE and also the association forum and other groups where you'll see showcases of different vendors uh, providing providing demos of their software, but also having nice discussions based on your preliminary requirements that you have. You can also get a lot of information online. You can get a lot of bad information as well. But I would start to look towards um, finding out as much as you possibly can about what's out there. The truth is that there is a vendor for everyone, but if you Google AMS or association management system or membership management database or customer relationship management system or relationship management system or engagement system, there's so many different names for basically what is an association management system. But you do a Google, you'll probably come up literally, literally with uh, over 50 different vendors. They are tiered differently and probably much, uh, you know, this is another type of presentation, but you have some homework to do where there's some organizations that, that are looking at many different things based on the initiatives of the organization. And, and um, it's really important to just know who those major players are. Set realistic expectation for all key stakeholders, whether it's the timing of the process that you have, if you have the luxury of timing and you're thinking a year ahead, two years ahead, well, you know, start to set the expectations and start to create a schedule for the process of going through selection. And get all the key stakeholders involved, from department heads to, of course, your leadership, and even so, to some point, your constituents. When can they expect that something will be done? Annual meeting is, is always a great opportunity to make announcements and about any initiatives that you may have. Assemble a well-represented selection team. This really is important. So um, you want to have those different departments, membership, events, uh, education, foundation, everyone represented in these meetings, but you're pulling together more of a task force that has responsibilities to understand and document their requirements of their departments. This gets into the next point of gathering requirements and developing a comprehensive RFP. Those individuals who work in those departments, whether they are department heads, really we like to look at them as an AMS vendor, as knowledge experts. They understand the business so well. They even understand the data so well from their existing system. Um, those are folks that can really start to gather information maybe from the end users or possibly they are an end user, so they'll be able to give you first-hand information on requirements. But developing a comprehensive RFP is important, getting the requirements down. I won't always say that it's important to get every definitive detail about what you do. It's more important to look at the goals of what you're trying to achieve for each uh, department and its use of the AMS, and then getting it down to the features that are important to you. 
Then you narrow the scope of vendors to distribute the RFP out to. We would absolutely think that, uh, you know, we've gotten RFPs and we felt like, oh my gosh, how many uh, AMSs are they sending this out to? 20 or 30 of them. Well, as I mentioned, you're going to start to find out pretty quickly when you do the research uh, where all these AMSs uh, sit as far as the organizations they serve and the different types of objectives their customers have. But we would recommend that you look at no more than six vendors, even that is a lot to go to and get an RFP or get an RFP out to, but also get proposals from and do analysis. Uh, so try to narrow it to five or six. Request system demonstrations. Um, we would say by that point, you should be able to filter it down to about three vendors that you feel really good about. You've heard great thing about them. You may have even uh, called some of their references ahead of time and spoken to folks in the industry, whether it was out on the, the community listservs like ASAE has, or going through and, and talking to your peers in the marketplace at industry conferences. Uh, you'll find out very quickly those, the, the, the uh, vendors that you want to move forward with. And then always keep your leadership and everyone else um, in the loop. Communication of the progress that you've made is very important. Again, visibility and just making sure that everyone knows and everyone's marching in the same direction is key. All right, so general tips on what to look for in AMS vendor. Uh, there's, there's things to may be considered first, okay? And I mentioned this a little bit earlier. I've kind of alluded to it in that you have to know who you are. You have to know what your organization's all about and maybe some of the things that you're willing to tolerate and not. Um, there are, just for full disclosures, there are association management system vendors out there that don't want to work with small organizations, period. You call them up, you tell them how, how your size, uh, they kind of just they're polite to you, but they'll send you to somebody else. Then there's uh, AMS vendors who um, really are maybe too small for you, and they don't have a system that's robust enough to manage your needs. There's many different types of AMS vendors, different companies that'll serve you. And I like to think about it as a marriage. I've heard consultants say this many times over. I think I've maybe heard you say, it, Justin, in that it's truly a marriage. And to this, for this marriage to be successful, you have to find what is compatible with your organization. Who's gonna serve you the best? Who's not gonna treat you as a small organization, but an organization that they have to serve and serve well? who's going to be able to handle complex requirements that you may have. So looking at your organization, it's important to know a few things. What type of organization are you? Are you a trade association? Are you a professional organization? Is it possible you are a, a hybrid of both, serving both individuals and institutions and company members? Are you an association management company that serves multiple clients? Is it really about that one client? Are you looking as a AMC and your goals would possibly be, well, you have to scale up and you have to stay profitable and you have to serve just a multitude of clients with a multitude of needs. AMCs think about those things. Are you credentialing organizations? I don't even care about membership. All we serve are applicants, certificates, participants in our certification and credentialing and accreditation program. So organizations can be very different. And I tell you that because it's very true that some systems cannot handle those types of applications effectively, some of these applications effectively. Some trade associations, we've heard common complaints from when they've converted to our systems that their vendor was just their software was designed for to handle individuals. So then you suffer on company company uh, memberships, you suffer on company, you know, uh, group registration, you suffer on the reporting that you're getting out of database. Very, very common. So really try to understand who you are. I know you do know who you are, but communicate this as well as possible to the vendor that you're talking to. And you have to be able to test them on it. You have to go and, and, and talk to uh, references and, and see what the makeup of their client base is. Primary revenue sources. 
Now, not that this has a lot to do with it, but it's true. You look at your organization, do you make, make most of your revenue on membership renewals? Are you making most of your membership, making most of your revenue on your events, your conferences, your workshops, many workshops throughout the year? Are you making your revenue on your education program and providing certification to your client base? This is important because, again, vendors, AMS, AMS vendors can do different things, many, so many things with their systems. You have to really be able to see what's important to you and what they do well. You may hear in the industry, well, you go to some websites and you look at some AMS vendors, and they have many, many different modules. Well, what's interesting about that is that's how much research you have to actually do. You have to look at well, how robust is their credentialing module, how robust is their careers module, how robust is their, is their membership module even because I've got a very uh, unique membership application. Very important to just understand that. Your staff size, certainly important. Why is that important is because eventually you're gonna be the ones to implement the software and you, you will have a role in that and you have to know that, that some organizations are, have products that are usually turnkey, usually on the lower cost side and they can implement very fast for small staff associations. Now the caveat to that is that it doesn't mean just because you're small you don't have the needs of a large organization. In fact, that is usually the case. But know when to reach out for other resources. If you're, if you're an organization with a small staff and you're just trying to get your day job done and meet the needs of your organization and your constituents, it may be wise to go out and reach out to a consultancy group. Um, there's so many out there. You can reach out to the Bross group. You can reach out to others. But it's worth it to bring some, somebody in to help run point. It's not on the selection process and definitely possibly engaging them for some sort of a project management role in your organization. Available uh, skill sets and resources. You know, we've seen even smaller organizations have IT skills. It really depends what you have and you have to measure that up and communicate that well to the vendor. So do you have technical skills? Do you have a database administrator? Do you have someone who actually builds reports in your organization? Not that everything should be technical or needs to be technical, but it is nice to put that in front and let the vendor respond to that, that uh, request. Maybe perhaps some systems, not maybe, but some systems are set up a little bit more, again, to be more turnkey, off the shelf, configurable, less customizable. <clears throat> Complexity of processes, I've kind of mentioned this, but dues, application, certification. <clears throat> there's, there's a reason why there's enterprise level software out there and there's a reason why there's software products that are high volume. So typically, I don't want to say the more expensive uh, vendors, out, AMS vendors out there are typically the ones implementing less number and focusing more on, on uh, larger implementations. but it is true that there's, there's uh, vendors out there that are much more interested in selling volumes of their software. And so if you have complex needs, complex processes, it's, it's, it's almost likely that they're not going to be able to get to that level of detail to satisfy those needs. Again, focus on your priorities of your organization and what's important to you. Uh, so structure of your constituencies, do you just deal with your members and that's it? No, usually these days we're seeing organizations, they've got chapters, they've got regions, they've got multiple committees, they've got, so that does speak to some of the capabilities in many AMSs today. Um, however, you really wanna see what's out there. It's very possible you don't need the, the, uh, the uh, latest and greatest and biggest system out there, but you need more of a system that can manage just the needs that you have. Existing systems in use, I talked about this earlier, but looking at the different technologies that you have and doing that internal audit, you might get that done in the IT assessment that you do with your consultant, but knowing what you need to integrate with. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to integrate with every product that you have that you, that's in use there, but possibly you just want to do a periodic upload to the AMS. Um, those are things to consider though, and definitely to put in your RFP. The conditions of your data, I said dirty data earlier, now I'm saying it in a nicer way, but really you do have to look at, at your data and starting to do cleanup on it, 
look at all the duplicates. Many AMSs today will, will actually start to help you migrate that data and flag some of the duplicates that come over, but it's critically important. Do as much as you can up front. If you can't do it, then um, if you don't have the time to do it, then hire temps to come in help to help uh, uh, do the deduping and also to clean up the records and to purge data that might not be useful in a conversion. Are you a business, global business organizations? Not all IMSs support global business well through payment processing, through membership structures, through even foreign characters and foreign languages, all considerations. And then the culture of your organization. What type of organization are you? Is it a, um, you know, uh, you have to get along with your vendor and it is a marriage, as I mentioned earlier, it's a partnership you really have to look at whether their culture is compatible with yours. And the big B, B word, I saved it for last, is budget. Um, I can't tell you how many times we'll get a call from, from just anyone or we'll get emails coming in or inquiries coming in through our website about our system. How much does your system cost? How much does your system cost? It's a tough question to really answer and not that we try to avoid it. We really want to be upfront and, and so that, you know, we can set the right expectations for anyone we speak with. But as you can imagine, the, the term AMS and all the other terms for it have just really got a little bit convoluted over the years and so everyone thinks, well, systems should cost the same. Uh, so far from the truth. You really need to establish your budget, speak to your peers in the industry, understand how much they were paying for their system to be implemented. Usually you will pay for what you get in most cases. Um, not all the time, sometimes you pay too much, but really you start have to start thinking about, do you go the low cost alternative? And there's a lot of vendors out there. In fact, the majority of them are on the low cost end and, and nothing wrong with that. They definitely meet the requirements of their, their uh, customers. But most organizations we meet, um, they, have, they have determined their budget, they've put it, they've not communicated in the RFP, but um, it is worth it to at least understand what do you get for the amount of money that you can afford uh, to go out and get a new AMS. So what to look for in an AMS vendor? And this is our suggestions. Now I've broken it down two ways, not just the AMS, but the AMS vendor and the product itself. Really two separate things. In my opinion, and mostly what I've seen and talked to con consultants in the industry, you have to have a successful implementation and you have to have a successful company that is gonna support you year to year to year. Um, so what are you looking for? Experience, experience, experience. This goes beyond just, um, you know, asking them for that in the RFP. Give us, give us the resume or give us some of the qualifications of your, your team. I think it's always useful to actually interview some of those teams sometimes. As much as the AMS vendors might kind of grin about it and say, gosh, it's such a pain and I don't, they don't have time for that. They are, you know, your salesperson, your AMS salesperson is selling you that team in a way, not just the product, but that team that's going to implement the system. So look for experience across the board because I can tell you today, one thing I've heard often is that um, many implementations will go bad because AMS vendors will throw uh, junior resources at your project. Now I'm not saying that you know junior resources are bad. What I'm saying is that there's got to be guidance, there's got to be supervision, there's got to be, um, you know, there's got to be great accountability there. And so uh, just make sure you know what you're getting. Long-term partnership, enough said about that, but you are looking for the long-term. And all I can say is look at the vendors, know what their roadmap looks like, look at their longevity in the marketplace, look at their maturity in the marketplace, but also know what their business plans are. Are they an AMS that's, their strategy is to, to uh, be acquired. Um, well, you know, if, if that's the case, I, you know, I don't want to speak for all of them because I think there are benefits to acquisitions, but in most cases it is changing that final product that is sold to you and it's changing the company in many ways where good people tend to leave during acquisitions, um, focus on the product development tend to change, especially if they're competing with other products that the AMS vendor is selling or supporting. So really try to know 
what their, their whole makeup is about, and you'll feel much more confident going into it as a long-term partnership. Find a company of problem solvers. Uh, it's a complex, complex process uh, with AMSs, so find a company that can solve problems, a company that has a consistent track records, happy customers, proven implementation methodologies of processes, technology, and people where it all comes together to create success for you. And data conversion expertise. It represents so much risk in a project, as I mentioned. Data conversion is key, so find out who is actually doing the conversion on your project. Who would do it? Do they have dedicated resources, or are they going to just give it to the business analyst on site to do the conversion? Conversion takes more than just the vendor, I will tell you that. Usually it takes involving the customer just because there's no one else who knows the data better than the customer. So there is involvement and accountability on both ends. Financial and structural uh, uh, stability of the company as well. So as far as the product, um, and I can't, I can't go and say this is for everyone, but these are characteristics of most AMSs. You go out to the marketplace, see the ones that have been in business a long time and have, have really proven themselves in the marketplace. They're going to have an enterprise architecture, which will allow your organization to stay with them for a very long time and scale and to even meet the most complex needs. If you have any programs or requirements that come up down the road, you want to know that that, that technology can support it. Robust modules, right out of the gates, you should be able to have your vendor match up the, the modules that they have to the requirements that you're looking for and explain them. Configurable versus customizable. This is a long discussion, but all I can say is these days you should not be paying for these customizations that can be crazy, crazy expensive and long. I'm not saying that there shouldn't be customizations because many organizations, that's the way you can reach almost, um, you know, those requirements that you have just reaching a little bit further through a customization, but it's the large customizations that you might need. Uh, integration capabilities, again, being able to talk to third-party products. Accounting and audibility. This is sometimes what separates some of the lower cost systems to the ones that cost a little bit more, and it is accounting. I can't tell you how many times we've had conversions done from uh, lower cost vendors, and again, not taking away anything from them. They have their place and they meet the needs of many more organizations. But you can't fail in an audit. You cannot mess up renewals. You cannot mess up transactions. So you have to have a very strong AR package in, in the AMS. And you'll find out very quickly those, those systems that have that. Process automation, if you have a lot of manual processes and, and automating um, processes are important to you, whether it's an application process, a um, it could be some sort of certification or anything that involves just lots of manual efforts, you want to look at a platform that has process automation and workflow. Reporting and business intelligence, I mentioned that's usually the biggest disappointment with many database systems. Very key in looking at those, those features in the systems and, and looking at being able to pull data in real time. You get both the production and development environments. So it's not just one system that if you make a mistake on while you're just trying to learn a new process or learn a new feature, it messes up the integrity of the system. Your vendor should give you two different systems. One is the production system that is live to the world. The other one is your development and training system, or sometimes called a staging environment, which you should keep for the duration of your relationship, not just the implementation. Proven hosting, uh, making sure that your vendor provides that service level agreement and they have a good reputation with uptime in the marketplace. Scalable for growth, if you're an organization on the move, growing, may possibly working with um, institutions or college students or organizations that tend to grow chapters very fast, you want to look at a scalable platform. You want to look at, that's when you do want to ask a little bit about what's underneath the hood here and, and look at the technologies proven ability to grow with your organization. Flexible development platform, not for everyone again, but maybe you're an organization that have developers or you work with software developers, a consulting firm, you want to make sure the system is able to support them in extending the product out. So with many different great applications in the marketplace today and those that can actually be built on different types of frameworks, 
technical frameworks that you may hear a lot about, whether it's a .NET or a PHP or open source type of platform or anything else, you want to know that that product can actually support you and development can be done just for the easy things, like just developing new standard reports, making them available, putting a new tab on the interface, uh, possibly distilling some data that would be important to your leadership uh, to get in a dashboard. And then responsiveness with mobile, I won't go into mobile, it's a sole separate presentation, but uh, most AMSs today should be able to support mobile or at least through a third-party vendor that they work with. Integration, as I mentioned, very, very important. Make sure your vendor has an integration layer of their product. Um, typically, they're going to be made up of, of open protocols and standards and well-accepted standards that are around today uh, with web services because you're going to find that in time, you'll look at many best-in-class products, whether they're communities products out there, which we've integrated with, content management systems, learning management systems, online journals, Salesforce automation, e-marketing. Your AMS has a lot of functionality already in it. What you need to do is just assess if there's, there's other systems that you might need to go to in the future, well, you have the doorway in and out of that, that product. Many times, many, many times we see so many uh, AMS vendors or so many, I'll just say, so many organizations that are converting to our systems and they have the biggest problem. Why? Because they have the one and all system that does not have great integration. So typically they're buying that AMS and then they're stuck with the bolted on built-in CMS. There's nothing wrong with having your own CMS system as an AMS vendor. The problem is if it relies so much on the one built-in system, well, it's very hard to separate them if you start to think, well, we've got to migrate to a new website or a new community. And case in point and true example is that ASAE will, will say this time after time at technology conferences that you're more likely to, you are likely to uh, turn over your website between every two to three years. And I can tell you firsthand that that's one of the biggest um, projects that we hear, or at least calls that we get from customers, they're switching to a new website. We've had a customer for about, about 17 years, and we were just counting the other day, how many websites have they been through since, we've been with, since they've been with us? And it, it literally, they have been through nine websites. So again, know that you need that flexibility to get in and out of your product. Quickly about the implementation, I know we're closing in on the, on the um, hour here. But I, this was a really a bonus I threw in here because I think it's important, as I mentioned earlier, you can't just talk about what it takes to go through an effective selection process to choose the right AMS. I think it's very clear now that the right AMS is going to be the one based on the requirements and the makeup of your organization and also the budget. So you have to look at all those things. But once you choose that vendor, it does not stop. In fact, the real risk begins because now you've selected that vendor, you have to go through the implementation process. So you're going through a series of, of, of contracts, possibly negotiating final points on contracts. So you do that with either your legal counsel or your executive director or CEO, whoever handles that in your organization. But going back with the vendor, making sure that's clearly articulated what are your responsibilities and what are their responsibilities. A kickoff meeting, typically a short meeting with stakeholders where it's more of a transition from an AMS sales team to the implementation professional services team. And so um, introduction should be made, but you should always try to look at making sure that that vendor is doing the proper transition of all the documentation and as many conversations that they've had with you to your professional services team so that they're not starting from scratch. Because I can tell you one of the biggest time wasters when they go and do that initial phase of the scope of work or the analysis or discovery, you feel like you, you don't want to feel like you're starting all over. It can take hours, sometimes days to just get that transfer that knowledge. So most good software vendors are going to help their professional services team understand all the details that they've been through with the client. And they don't just walk away. They're, they're there to assist them and help with the communication going on into the project. Scope of work analysis, uh, 
critical part of, of what should be done. Some people like to call it design study or some will call it a uh, statement of work, but it's really starting to document all the requirements of your organization, looking starting with that RFP that you sent them, mapping the requirements that you have to possibly the modules that their AMS has, looking at different customizations, very unique configurations, looking at business rules of your organization, documenting a lot into the scope of work, what should become the scope of work, which in many organizations it becomes, or to many AMSs, it becomes the customer's warranty to move forward and to deliver um, what they promise. Very important. Implementation stages, once you agree on the scope of work analysis, you get to the implementation stages of doing the installation, the configuration and setup of the system, consulting services, setting up the system, going through a series of data conversion, uh, program training, testing, and then you go live. So the big bright day is here. Again, you may not go live with the entire AMS right away, but possibly the most important critical piece is you've already converted the data over, but you may be using an outside registration system. That's completely fine with good systems. You should be able to convert data over at different phases. Initial support should be done by your project team. They should not just walk away and leave you and hand you over to customer support because you've built up a relationship with them and a lot of knowledge has changed hands. So there has to be a time of working out the kinks after you go live and also just making sure that everything's smooth um, and according to the test plan that you've had and, and, and the scope of work that you initially had. And then there's a transition over to your customer support department. Again, customer support is key to keeping that relationship going with your vendor for years and years and years. But, um, and you have involvement. So along the phase of the life cycle of the project, you're going to be involved. Just keep in mind, you have to expect that and your vendor will be able to communicate that. A good vendor will be able to communicate that to you and put together a really solid project plan which involves you and your team and any outside vendors, third party vendors as well. So I'm sorry I ran a minute, possibly two over here. I did have a lot to squeeze in there, but I thought that last slide was possibly important to you. Um, I, would, I would definitely urge you if you have any questions, anything that you would like me to clarify, please reach out to me. Uh, Justin's information is here. Justin, I'm gonna hand it back to you if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, and if you guys do, uh, if you have an extra minute or two right now that you wanna ask a question, please feel free to do so. I'm going to keep talking in the meantime, but go ahead and uh, throw them in that chat window or the Q&A section and I can uh, ask Arj or answer the question myself if uh, need be. Um, but one, one quick thing, uh, do take down our contact information. Um, obviously, Arj's product, uh, you know, is, is one, of the, one of the ones we feel like is a pretty good one out there um, to take into consideration when you go through the AMS process. Um, but please do consider, if it's not Ross Group, taking on somebody to help you uh, with your AMS selection process. Also looking at a technology assessment um, as being an enabler for you to move your organization forward. Um, one other quick uh, little hit. Um, we are going to be doing some more webinar series. I don't have a full schedule right now on the next couple that we're going to be doing. But one of the ones we are putting together right now, and we talked about credentialing organizations and many non due revenue sources are credentialing now for organizations um, and also in learning management systems. But we're going to be uh, for Office 365 uh, doing, a, doing a webinar on workflow and how to um, how to how to make that process easier for you and automate it um, within a credentialing program. Um, and also uh, how your learning management systems and things like that and giving credit. So um, that's one of the things that's going to be coming up that we'll be looking, looking forward to. Uh, we do have a question here. Um, um, do, uh, oh, it's, does, uh, does Bross Group uh, assist with uh, setting out our, the RFQ process for a new AMS system, uh, absolutely we do. And um, I will go ahead and uh, if you want to reach out to me, um, anybody wants to reach out to me on, on, on helping with those, um, what those requirements are going to be for you, uh, we, we can definitely help with that. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and contact you after the event as well. Any other questions? Okay. 
Well, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us today. I'll continue. Uh, please do continue. Uh, I hope this benefited you, and please do continue uh, joining us for our Technology Simplifier webinar series. I'll be sending out an email with the slide deck, everyone. And uh, thank you again, Arj, so much for, for helping us out today. Your, your input is so valuable on this topic. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure, and uh, appreciate you uh, allowing me to come and present today. Okay, perfect. Um, thanks, everyone, and uh, we'll see you at the next one. Bye-bye.